So uh, <laughs> I realized I skipped over the kids' lesson um, <laughs> uh, there. I got too excited to sing Bible songs. And I guess that's uh, uh, that's the worst thing I do. That'd be odd. But um, no, today for the kids' lesson, you know, one of the things we talked about doing is we're going to uh, go over some. Um, you know, some uh, big words that we have in the Bible. And uh, the one we're going to look at tonight is one we talked about in community class today, which is the word providence. Now, we learned three words today in, um, in, in that class. We learned uh, creation, we learned decree, and we learned providence. And, you know, creation is the act of making something, right? God did that. Decree is the plan that he made. You know, the, the lesson talked a little bit about um, the, uh, the way in which uh, you know, a blueprint is a way we can think about the decree of God, right? A blueprint is what you do when you're getting ready to build a house, and you, know, you follow the blueprint, and as you follow the blueprint, you build the house, and then eventually the house shows up, right? Well, providence is the care of God over his plan. So... You know, in Creed's class, we talked about how God, you, in his providence, allowed Joseph to be sold into slavery. Now, we know that Joseph says in Genesis 50 that what his brothers meant for evil, right, the Lord meant for good. Right? And God oversaw that whole process of selling into slavery, uh, the situation with Potiphar's wife, you know, the placing of Joseph to be governor, you know, all of that stuff. And you know, the reason why providence is such a blessing to us is that we don't believe in luck. Right? We don't believe things just kind of happen. Right? We believe that everything is ordained of the Lord, taken care of by God, and we can trust that tomorrow will take care of itself because who's in charge of tomorrow? God. God is, right? So that's what providence means. And that's why providence is such a dear word to the Christian. right? Because it's an expression of our faith in the Lord. Right? So that's the, the big word we learned uh, this week is providence. Right? So let's go ahead and go to our scripture reading. Uh, unless you all want to sing again. Uh, <laughs> we could uh, go ahead and go to our scripture reading today, which will come from Psalm uh, 73. You want to turn there with me? Right. Well, you know, um, next week uh, we're going to start a lesson uh, through Tulip, uh, where we're going to kind of walk through, you know, that um, you know, uh, what do they call that when a word means things? Uh, Knowledge. Yeah, there, an acrostic. That's what it is. Um, <laughs> I need to learn big words every now and then too. But uh, and across it, right? You know, total depravity. You know, the and all that stuff, right? So we're going to walk through all that. Start next week. Well, this week we're going to kind of close out this beginning section with uh, another part on why evening worship, right? Why do we uh, meet in the evening to worship? And to do that, we're going to be looking at Psalm seventy-three. So let's go ahead and turn there, and I'll go ahead and read uh, from that person portion of God's word. Truly God is good to Israel, to such are as pure in heart, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Their pride serves as their necklace, violence covers them like a garment, their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak lost loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return here and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly. Who are always at ease, they increase in riches. Surely I've cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, God, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. 
When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Right. So, you know, this seems like a strange passage to go to talk about evening worship. But notice that last verse, verse 17. Until I went to the sanctuary of God, then I understood therein. Right? One of the great complaints that we have is when we see the wicked doing well. And when we see the blessed doing poorly. Right? As the world defines those kinds of things. Uh, but when we think about one of the reasons why God has given to us worship... Right? He's given us worship to help our understanding, right? to help us remember what the Lord has done for us. So, for instance, in morning worship and in evening worship, you know, what are some of the things we do in worship? Read the scriptures, right? Now, what's the purpose, what's the point of reading the scriptures? Right, life lessons, right? We learn things about how we should act and how we should do things. You know, and what else do we learn from, from the scriptures? Yeah, we learn about our Lord, right? We learn especially, right, especially when we learn those life lessons, right? We learn how the Lord works through those kind of things, right? That's one of the one of the purposes, for instance, of reading, you know, books like First Samuel. Or Second Chronicles, or Ezra and Nehemiah, right? We see in the real world, in real life, how God operates, and we also see how man operates. And sometimes, right, we hear good things about stuff that happens to God's people, right? For instance, in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. Right? They have been released from bondage in Babylon, and they're reestablishing all of the worship of the church. Right? They're rebuilding the temple. They are getting the uh, Levites and the priests back in their proper order and what they're supposed to be doing. Right? It's a time of rejoicing. But there's something else happening in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. Does everybody want everything to go back the way it was? No, right? There are people frustrating the plan, right? There are people uh, stopping the building of the walls, right? Literally, right? They are breaking the walls down after they get them built. And the people are frustrated. The people are wondering. And so what does Ezra and Nehemiah do? And they build a platform, right? And Ezra and Nehemiah get up on top of the platform. Right, so there's biblical basis for there to be this thing up here that I stand on, right? <laughs> it's not just so that you can see me, right? Because if, if we didn't have platform, what, what would happen? You might have to kind of crane your neck to find where I was, right? Well, you know, they, the, the idea is they're up, and then as they are worshiping the Lord, something happens. We hear about these older men crying. Now, do you, do you often see old men crying? No, right? And why don't we usually see old men crying? Because. <laughs> huh? Right? Because, right? Our, our, yeah, old men are tough, right? Old men aren't supposed to show emotion. They aren't supposed to show anything. But they're crying because they remember the worship of the temple before they went into Babylon. Now, there's two, there's two ways of thinking about that. Either they're crying because what they're experiencing doesn't equal the beauty of Solomon's temple, or, and this, this is my opinion, but I think it more likely they're crying because what have they not been able to do for 70 years in Babylon? Worship, right? But what are they getting to do now in the promised land? Getting to worship, right? And so they are being reminded that even though there are those who are frustrating the plans of the Lord, they're getting to worship God. Right? And it's reminding them of that regardless of how things look, 
They know the plan, the providence of God, the purpose of God. So one of the things we do in morning and evening worship is that we spend time reading about God, reading what God does, learning about who God is, and also being reminded of the way that God works. Now, what else do we do in worship besides read? Right, we pray, right? And, you know, what, what, what is prayer? Right, talking to God, right? Now, why do we talk to God? He's our father, right? You know, and also because God told us to. Right? You know, and is it a good idea to do what God tells you? Yes. yes, right? Now, have you ever thought about what it means to talk to God, right? You know, who is God? Our creator. Our creator, right? He made the heavens and the earth. And who are we? The creation. The creation, right? So we're human beings. He's God. And what do we get to do? We get to talk to God. Right? Now, do we believe that prayer changes things? Yes. yes, right? I mean, if we believe that prayer was just something we did because we were supposed to, would we do it? No, right? Because we believe that prayer works, right? We believe that you know, if we pray, pray for Aunt Sally's kidney and the Lord heals Aunt Sally's kidney, what happened? Our prayers were answered, right? The Lord worked through our prayers to, to heal. Right? We believe that that can happen. Um, even though we believe in providence and we believe in predestination and election and all that stuff, you know, that doesn't mean right, that God doesn't use our prayers in his work. But we also pray because you know, God... You know, is worthy of talking to, right? You know, you know that's unique about the Christian God, right? that we have the right and the privilege to go to God and talk to Him. Right? Now, do you have to do anything special in order to pray? No. Right? Do you have to be in a particular position? Do you have to be on your knees? No. no. You know, why, why do we get on our knees to pray? To be humble. Right, to humble, right? It's a sign of our, you know, our coming before the Lord, right? But it's not necessary for him to hear us, right? Now, in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, who got to pray to God? Everybody. The priests, right? You know, that, you know, if you needed a prayer, you know, for instance, let's think of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Why is she going to Eli? Not Eli, Eli, but going to Eli. He's a <laughs> yeah, because he's a priest, right? And, and what does Eli claim that is going on? Right, she's drunk, right? Um, and, and why does he think she's drunk? Because she actually believes in prayer, right? She's praying with the depth of her soul. Whereas, how do most people usually come to Eli and pray? Yeah, they just kind of like, you know, go through the motions and, you know, give him a piece of paper or something, right? But she really believes that prayer works. And Eli sees that, but he, he's so, you know, Eli has his own problems. But, you know, he doesn't understand because that's not how most people pray. Now, does that mean we have to pray with motion and with all kinds of gyrations and things like that? No, but, um, you know, the, the, again, the, the picture, the scene that we're meant to see there, again, is the importance, right, of believing that our prayers actually work. So we read the scriptures, right, to learn more about God, to learn more about our relationship to him, right? We pray because, not just because God's told us to, but because we believe that prayer works, right? Because that's part of what we do. Now, what else do we do in, in worship? We sing, right? And, and what is the purpose of singing? My right? praise, right? Getting thanksgiving to the Lord. One of the things that's real important for us to do is when we sing is that we pay attention to what we're singing, right? Uh, the content of our praise matters, 
Um, that, you know, it's one of the reasons why it's important that we just don't sing anything. All right? You know, you know, we don't you know sing Van Halen on Sunday morning, right? And, and why don't we sing Van Halen on Sunday morning? It's not appropriate, right, for the worship of the Lord, right? It's not made for that. But why do we sing the Bible songs? Because they've been made for the praise of the Lord, right? They have been given to us, you know, by God, obviously not in English, but translated from the Hebrew, to worship the Lord. And so, you know, we, we sing to praise the Lord, and it's important for us, again, to pay attention to the words, uh, because... Not every Bible song is the same. Right? Some Bible songs are lamentations, right? They're sad. And why do we need to sing sad songs? Because, right, we go through bad times, right? We're sad sometimes. And it's okay to be sad, right? To lament before the Lord because, you know, the Lord was, you know, Jesus Christ was sad. Right? He experienced right death. He experienced the realities of sin, right? And sin and the world around us should make us sad, right? There is times to lament. But sometimes it's okay to do what? Be happy, right? It's okay to be joyful sometimes in our song, right? That's you know, you know, what a Presbyterian is not real known for. <laughs> right? Being joyful. Right? It's okay for us to be excited to worship, right? To give thanks to the Lord joyfully, right? Because you know, there's a lot of times that it's worthwhile to be thankful to the Lord, right? And to show that thanksgiving, all right? And so when we think about, you know, evening worship, when we think about worship in general, is, you know, again, it's an opportunity for us to come together, right? To read the scriptures together, to sing together, to pray together, and also, there's one more thing we do in worship. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what am I doing right now? Preaching, right? Now, we believe something about preaching. Right? Um, can anybody get up and preach in the worship service? No, right? You know, what would happen if um, I got up here one Sunday morning and said, I don't feel like preaching today. Um, you know, RC, come up here and preach. Um, would that work? No. <laughs> no. Why, why wouldn't that work? He doesn't know what he's doing. That's right. He, he doesn't know. That's right. He doesn't know what he's doing. That's right. Um, you didn't need to put it that bluntly, but the, <laughs> right, because he hasn't been trained. Right. He he hasn't been called by the Lord to preach. Right. You know. So when Ezra or Nehemiah is up on the uh, on the thing preaching, right. He has been not just set aside for that, but he's been given the authority to do that, right? And so there's something unique about the preaching of the word, right? That doesn't make me special or anything. That's true. You know, elders can, can you know, the, the form of government uses the word exhort, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, because we, we, Presbyterians are real big on using fancy words, uh, when fancy words aren't necessarily needed, but uh, we, we like to use them. Uh, but yeah, so elders, right, can exhort, but, um, you know, but they've been set aside, right, for that purpose, right? And, and so when we think about all that, right, it's, it's another opportunity to hear from the Lord, to be, you know, blessed by the Lord, and to be strengthened by the Lord. Now, you know, we'll close on this, but last week we talked a little bit about, um, you know, the... Um, uh, you know the the you know the morning and evening sacrifices in the Old Testament, right? And so there is something to be said for beginning the Lord's day in the worship of God and ending the Lord's day in the worship of God, um, because what what are uh, uh, you know some of y'all getting ready to do tomorrow? Go to work, Go to work right? Uh, so that I can preach and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, you know, the, the idea there, right, is to prepare for the week ahead, right? To be ready for the week ahead. Because you know, is everything going to go to plan next week? No. Right, no. Right? You know, things are going to break. Things ain't going to work. People ain't going to work. 
right? All that stuff, right? So the opportunity we have, right, to, to kind of start on the right foot is an important part, right, of starting the Lord's Day and ending the Lord's Day in worship. And we'll go ahead and close on that. But any, any other thoughts or comments or anything? Thank you much. Well, let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for this time that you've set aside that we can gather together and to uh, think of the things of the Lord and uh, especially remember why it is that we gather together uh, to do uh, these things. And to God, we ask that you bless us as we go from this house tonight that uh, your hand would be upon each one of us and that you would strengthen us by your grace. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, our uh, benediction tonight comes from 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, uh, verses 11 uh, through uh, 14. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Finally, brethren, farewell, become complete, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Mm.